Well, welcome and good morning. I welcome you to our live sermon. I'm Pastor Jacob, and it's a great time and a great privilege that God has given to us, and I want to be thankful for that. I thank you as well for taking your time every week to join us and just spend time in God's word. I want us to say a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right into God's word together this morning, and so shall we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the love that you've given to us and thankful for this morning. Lord, I don't know how the week has been for everyone else, but we thank you that you allowed us to be here today. And so, Lord, we just pray that you minister to your children here and now, that you minister to them uh, with your word and, and just encourage them in the process as we study and be glorified as we hear your word and respond to it in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you've been following, you know we are going through the uh, Acts of the Apostles. And if you've not uh, been following and you're here today, we want to welcome you uh, to Acacia Community Church as we start in God's Word together and grow in the process. Last Sunday, we finished chapter 17 of the book of Acts, and we kind of saw uniquely uh, how Paul re responded and reacted to uh, his surroundings. We, we find Paul in Athens, and Athens is known and was known for idolatry. Literally, every kind of idols or gods, quote in court, could be worshipped in this city. Right, and so Paul finds himself in this place, and one of the things we saw was we are told that the spirit moved. He was moved in his spirit, and he did something. But then we we were encouraged just with how we share the gospel and well, how we are to share the gospel uh, with everyone, especially when you come in contact with those who don't know Christ, those who have never heard, those who are probably directly involved in idol worship. They're directly involved in witchcraft or, you know, they are atheists. They don't even believe God exists, how we reach to them. And so we were encouraged by that. If you uh, did not listen to that someone, did you did not watch that someone, I encourage you to later on take time and watch the someone so that you are uh, you're able to connect with what we're going to cover today. Now, so Paul serves and ministers in Athens. Of course, his colleagues Timothy and Silas joined him in Athens. And, and so the story begins. And so I'm just going to take a reading real quick from uh, Acts, that same passage we're in, but uh, that same book I'm in, but chapter uh, 18 this morning. And let's just see what happened as we continue with the story of uh, Paul's ministry and what God was doing in and through him and his team in expounding uh, the gospel ministry. And so Acts chapter 18 from verse 1 following to 17, and this is what it says. It says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his family, with his wife, rather, Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because it was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook of his garment, out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus the worship of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city were my people. And he stayed a year and six months, 
teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was a proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime or Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourself, I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them out from the tribunal and they all see Sosten, the ruler of the synagogue and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to any of this. Now, so verse one, of course, begins with saying after this, Paul left Athens. Now you need to go back to the verses before. That's why I was making reference to the sermon from last Sunday that you need to watch it. But something that had happened was so Paul meeting with with this the, the, some of the Jews, but with the Greeks who were full of idolatry and worshiping all of these different idols. The Bible says Paul preached to them. Paul proclaimed God's word to them, and many people believed. But as always, there were always people who don't want to believe. But after after his proclamation, there's something that that is said in chapter seven in verse. 34 says, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, Arifagites, a woman named Damaris, and many others with them. Right? So many people heard the gospel being proclaimed in Athens. And for some of them, the very first time they were hearing about God. That's why Paul started by using creation and general revelation to drive them from what they knew and were worshiping to what they did not know and ultimately point them to the living God and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, many heard the gospel for the first time and believed. And so they joined and became followers of Jesus Christ. And so after that experience in Athens, Paul continued. And so in his journey, he is now in Corinth, where churches will be born. And of course, in this place as well is where later on, Paul will write two letters to the churches that will be begun as a result of his ministry in this place. Now, just something about Corinth, this place that Paul is in, this place that Timothy and Silas will arrive later on to join Paul uh, and Priscilla and Aquila. Corinth was another big city, actually bigger than Athens, more influential in, in the Greek world. And it, it was like the access point. It, it's a city that joined the, the south and the west part of Rome altogether, and in Greece, no one could pass across without going through Corinth. Now, it's also in Corinth that part of a lot of idolatry was happening, but one of the biggest one of all of those was the temple of Aphrodite or the temple of Diana, the, the goddess of love and war that resided in this place with thousands of temple prostitutes. And so people moved in and out every day by evening people are flocking the temples and the streets to get services from these temple prostitutes, both men and women, by the way. And so there are a lot of idolatry, a lot of evil practices and, and all of these things is happening. And so Paul finds himself in his journey to this place. And there's something that we see happening here. God is reaching territories, God is reaching places, reaching people that today we would say they're not deserving, they're not worthy. Those are the people God is reaching. Just, just remembered from last Sunday when Paul was in Athens, these are quote-unquote pagans, these are idol worshippers, these are a thing, some of them did not even believe God exists. Those who did, they didn't care about his existence because in their mind, God exists somewhere. He cannot be known. He does not 
care is not even interested in the affairs of humanity. But when Paul saw them, the Bible says he was moved. The spirit in him was moved and he proclaimed the gospel to them. Now here he is in Corinth with one of the biggest temple of a pagan deity worshiped and all evil practice is associated to this temple and the city. And what's Paul doing? Preaching the gospel. You see, the gospel of God is the power that brings salvation to all who believe, including the people that we probably might consider our level as undeserving of God's grace or unworthy of his forgiveness or far gone, far, they're too evil, they're too wicked. The gospel still reaches them and we see God in his plan and in his desire to want to reach them and it was reaching them. But as we started these verses, the focus of, of these verses today is going to be on, on being a team because that is something that we will learn from the life of Paul and his colleagues being a team. Of course, we've seen right from when Paul began his first missionary journey in chapter 13, Paul was with, uh, with Barnabas and they journeyed in the Galatian region and he preached the gospel. They preached and moved. At the beginning, uh, John Mark was with them, though then he left after that. We see ministry going on. They finished that successfully. They went back and we see the report in chapter 15 of what God was doing among the non-Jews or in the Gentile world. And then he journeys and do this second missionary trip. And he's with Silas and somewhere along the way, he has taken on Timothy. And so he's with a team. But we see now in these verses we just read, Priscilla and Aquila are joining. But what is making Paul to have this kind of team? And what's helping them to be a team? That is what we're going to study and learn from these verses today. How can we be a team? How can we continue serving and working and growing together as a team like we see Paul and his colleagues doing? Well, number one, how can we be a team? Number one, by being a friend. How can we build a team and how can we be a team? Number one, by being a friend. Now, I want you to notice, so because Priscilla and Aquila were in Rome, and so it's, it's possible because there was already a church in Rome that they were already believers and they fled, literally they fled from Rome because of the persecution and the threat and the, the, the leadership of Claudius. But they were a friend and they offered their friendship to Paul. So Paul has just left Athens and is gone to this new city. Doesn't know anyone there, of course, except for the fact that Priscilla and Aquila are believers, right? They didn't know them, but they are friends, right? They're Jewish believers that fled persecution, but they welcomed Paul into their home. Now, I want you to notice this, the one Priscilla and Aquila are having problems of their own. They've, they've had to flee Rome, which was their, their place of residence, which is their home. And that meant they probably did not cover and they were not able to pack everything and get everything they needed. They, they probably just came with as little as possible into Corinth. Right, And so they have their own issues, their own problems, but they did not allow the problems they were experiencing. They did not allow their circumstances stop them from being friendly, stop them from being God's ambassadors in God's hand and feet. And so when Paul comes, the Bible says, these guys are just laughing and, and, and so, Paul phoned them, phoned Aquila and Priscilla, and look at what happened. He went to see them, and because it was of the same threat, look at that, he says he stayed with them and worked with them. 
these guys welcomed Paul. They extended the hand of fellowship to Paul. He stayed with them and he actually walked with them. So how was Paul able to continue in the gospel ministry? How was Paul able to stay for 18 months in this place and share the gospel with these people? Something that leads to churches being born in this place. Well, because there were people who were willing to be friends with him. There were people who were willing to extend a hand of fellowship to them and I mean to him and of course later on to his team as well and make it possible for them to work together. Being friends. You see, True friendship does not consider one's own safety, one's own circumstances, but the one of the other person. You see, Priscilla and Aquila were having challenges of their own. They've just fled their home. They've just left their friends and family in Rome because of the persecution, because of the threat that the emperor and the new leader just brought, and they're in this place. But when Paul arrives and Paul is in need, these two guys, this man and his wife, did not consider their own. They did not say, well, we want to help you. We wish we could have helped you. But you see, we're new in this place. We don't know you. We don't have enough. We don't have a lot. But they just welcomed him. They said, well, he's a minister of the gospel, just like we are. He's a fellow servant of God, just like we are. Please, you're welcome. Let us serve the Lord together. They extended a hand of fellowship to them. See, they did not consider their own challenges. They looked at the one that Paul had. You see, Priscilla and her husband became reliable friends to Paul and his team. And as a result of that, we see Paul was able to execute his ministry duties. Paul was able to share the gospel, reason both with the Jews who were in Corinth and with the Gentiles. And as a result of that, we'll read and follow that the gospel was actually proclaimed and that people actually got saved and life were transformed. And later on, we'll see the churches were actually born in this place. And as a matter of fact, because they extended a hand of fellowship and they were friends with Paul, they offered a home for Paul to stay in. Paul had time to write a letter to the church in Thessalonica. And so Thessalon, Paul's letter to Thessalonica was written while Paul was here in Corinth. And so in this 18 months of staying here, Paul is staying with them. He's actually working. The Bible tells us he was a tent maker. And so he's earning a living that way. He's sharing the gospel. He's being apologies and defending the gospel from the Judaizers who were opposing the gospel and opposing the name of Christ, but he's also still concerned about the church that was planted in Thessalonica. Now you remember that the, the, the Jews in Thessalonica did not actually like Paul and his team. They persecuted them and chased them away from Thessalonica to the point that when Paul and, and his team arrived in Berea and they were preaching the gospel in Berea, those G same Jews from Thessalonica heard about it what did they do? They traveled all the way from Thessalonica to Berea to do the same thing. They incited violence and had Paul and his team again just from Berea. But Paul still had love for these guys. And so in this place, because there were friends in this place, Paul was able to write a letter that we know as Thessalonians. As Thessalonians was written, in this place. So how can we be a team? How can we serve and grow and minister and do what God has called us to do? Well, one, by being a friend, you need to be a friend. So the question is, are you a friend? Are you a friend? Could what is being said about Priscilla and Aquila be said about you? You see, one of the biggest challenges that we have today is that many of the people who are supposed to watch your back are the ones stubbing it. That's the biggest challenges we have today. One of the many, 
that's even affecting ministry is that the people were supposed to be friends, the people were supposed to stand side by side with you and work alongside of you and watch your back are the ones stopping you. But see, Paul had a friend and had friends and Priscilla and Aquila in this context were those friends. And as a result, Paul and his team were able to continue in the gospel ministry. I want to challenge you, be a friend. If you're part of a team, if you will serve and God has called you alongside someone, called you to be a part of a team somewhere, you need to work as a team and you need to be a friend. Whether it is in the worship team, you all need to be friends to each other and watch each other's back and stand side by side with each other so that the work of God can continue. Are you called to leading a church? Be your team, and being a team means you be friends with each other, with your pastor, and as an elder, as deacons, with the ushers, and all the people that God has put together uniquely for the sake of the gospel, that you are friends, because we cannot be friends. We can, you see, you cannot have a close friend if you are not a close friend. And so many times we say, well, I want to have a close friend, but people are not there. Well, you see, the reason why you might not have a close friend that you rely on is because probably you are not a close friend who can be relied on. So do you need to have, do you want a friend that you can rely on, a close friend, a confident? You need to be a close friend and a confident and someone who is there that people can rely on, then you will have someone you can rely on. Is it Paul could rely on these guys because they were able to rely on him. He joined them, he stayed with them, but he was working with them. And they were serving together. Number two, be reliable. How can we build a team and be a team? Be reliable. As a member in that team, be reliable. Well, let's let's look at what, what happened here. And so we read verses five and six, right? And so verse five says, so when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook of his garment and said to them, your blood be on your heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go on to the Gentiles. I want to focus on Paul and, I mean, Silas and Timothy. Now, Silas joined Paul right at the end of the first missionary journey after Paul and Barnabas returned in chapter 15. They had to go to Jerusalem to meet with the other elders and apostles who were in Jerusalem and one share what God was doing among the Gentiles, how salvation had come among the Gentiles, but also to solve these issues and, and false teaching that was arising that you cannot truly be saved if you are not a Jew, that you first have to become a Jew, convert to Judaism, and all of those, then you can be saved. Right? And, and so that was dealt with. But at the end of that conference or meeting or council is, a, is what's known by the very first church council, by the way, we see Barnabas taking John Mark and going to Cyprus and Paul to Silas and journey. And so one, Silas has been with Paul right from that time. And then along the way, they took they got Timothy and took him on, and he's been here. Now, I want you to see how reliable at this point Silas and Timothy were, right? Now, one, Paul knew he could rely on Silas and Timothy to the point that now when they arrived in Thessalonica and they shared the gospel, of course, remember, it began in Philippi. So Paul and Silas, and Timothy, they're in Philippi, and what happened? Paul and Silas actually thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, falsely accused, and as a result of that, of course, remember in chapter 16, the God miraculously delivered them, but as a result of that, the Philippian jailer got saved, 
and later on we see Lydia getting saved and the church is born there. Right, but then they journey and come to Thessalonica, where they preach the gospel. People get saved, but some of the Judaizers are not happy with that. And what do they do? They oppose them, and a lot of chaos that happened. And so Paul had to flee, and Paul had to go and leave. But Silas and Timothy stayed and strengthened the guys and still followed and joined Paul and Paul in Berea. And in Berea, the same thing happened because the Bible says the same Jews, the same guys who had opposed them in Thessalonica came, they traveled all the way. You see, when, when, when Satan is opposing the things of God, he will go to, the, to every extent. When he's opposing the things of God because he's going to do everything he can to try and make sure it doesn't happen. But the truth is there's no force on earth or under the earth that can prevent the gospel from being proclaimed, that pro prevent the name of Christ from being proclaimed. Well, people have tried. Emperors and kings and rulers and leaders have tried, but the name of Christ still stands. The gospel still stands. You might try and persecute Christians. You might kill Christians, but you'll never be able to destroy Christianity because Christianity is built on the name of Jesus Christ. And as long as Jesus Christ is alive, there will be Christianity. There will be salvation. And that can never change. That will never be destroyed. And as long as Jesus is alive and forever he will be, there is hope. Right? But we see Silas and Timothy, again, had to remain behind in Athens. I mean, in Berea, while Paul went on to Athens. And that's why in, when you read in chapter 17 from verse 16, it says, while Paul was waiting for them, while Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy, who were left behind in Berea to come. You see, these men were reliable. Paul knew even if he's not there, they could continue with the work. They would be faithful to finish the work. They would be faithful to do what needed to be done. And Paul did not need to be there. Paul did not have to be there to supervise them, to kind of follow them up around, to kind of keep reminding them this, need, this needs to be done and you've not done it and you're not doing it well. You need to do this. They knew what needed to be done. They were committed to it and they were, they were reliable. And so they joined him in Athens, right? Now, as we read and study, we then discover that from Athens, after what we just saw last Sunday in, at the end of chapter 17 in Athens, it then appears that Paul sent Silas and Timothy back. At least Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. Because when you read 1 Thessalonians, Chapter 2, Paul kind of describes and reminds the believers in Thessalonica about their experience and what happened while they were there. And then in chapter 3, he now tells them the reason why he sent back Timothy to be with them. He said, we've always wanted to come back. We long to and we still want to, but the enemy has been hindering us. So when we cannot bear it anymore, what did we do? We sent Timothy to you to see you, hear from you, speak to you and bring back the report. And now that we've heard from you, we encourage. And so Timothy was sent. Again, a reliable man who was sent to Thessalonica to encourage the church there, to preach to them, to speak to them, to remind them, to pray with them, to disciple them, to equip them. And Paul was confident that Timothy would do exactly what needed to be done. Paul was not sitting here in Corinth and saying, I, I wonder what he said today. I hope he's not messed up. I hope he's still okay. He was confident because Timothy was a reliable man. Silas, it would appear the Silas was sent to Philippi. At least you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9. And Philippians as well, in 3, 4, it appears that Silas was there as well because he mentions the report 
that he received from these guys. And now here we're told in, in, in verse five, and so when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, they found Paul occupied in the word, Silas and Timothy again arrived, and the reliable men they were, they came and followed Paul and preached the gospel again, they joined him. So why was Paul able to continue? Why was the gospel ministry flourishing in the midst of all of the challenges, the threats and opposition that Paul was facing is because he had reliable friends, because he had a team that was made up of reliable people. And we need that. We need to be reliable. We need to have people who are reliable and we ourselves need to be that. Because guys, ministry is hard, it's challenging. And it becomes much more if we cannot rely on the people we're supposed to work with. If the people we're supposed to work with and alongside of are also the one fighting and opposing. You see, one of the strengths of a team lies in how reliable its members are. I want to say that again. One of the strengths of a team relies on how depends on, it lies in how reliable the members are. So the question is, as a member of a team somewhere, are you reliable? So before you look at the other person and say, well, that person is not reliable, that person is ABCD, the question for me to you right now is, are you reliable? Yes, that person might not be, the other people might not be, but are you reliable? Or you're saying, well, the other person is not reliable, therefore I will also stop being reliable. So we need to be reliable. And so question is, are you reliable? Question number two, can you be relied upon to do the job that needs to be done? I want to say this, this, this one is very important, this, this third question on this. Would the work of God continue if it was left in your hands? If it was up to you, if it got to a point where you were the only one who could speak, who could share, who could carry on God's work, would that work continue? Would you be faithful and reliable to continue doing the work of God or you say well why should I bother why should I continue with this when everyone else is not there you see there were times where Paul could not be and he had to rely on his friends and the word and the word continued because the friends were reliable like later on we'll discover when we read Paul's letter Paul had to one time send Timothy back to Ephesus We've not gotten to Ephesus yet, but Paul had to send Timothy to Ephesus to lead and encourage churches there. Paul had to send Titus there to, to, in the island of Crete for, uh, for the same purpose, to help churches in the island of Crete grow and mature. As leaders, we need to know that, that we need others. But we also need to make sure that we are reliable and each one of us need to be reliable. And so if we are going to be a team, we must be willing to let others into our life. Number three, be hospitable. How can we be a team and grow a team? Be hospitable. And so we read in verse seven, this is what we are told is what's happening in verse seven. And so we are told, and so after Paul, he, he left there where he was having these discussions with the Jews who were just reviling him and mocking him and then and, and opposing him. We're told he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus. And he was a worshiper of God and his house was next door to the synagogue. Titus Justus, believed by many to be Titus, Gaius Justus, the same guys that later on we find Paul speaking about, especially when he writes his letter to the church in Corinth, he believes it's this, this same guy, which would mean he was a Roman, and then because they had always had three names, right? But you see, this man was willing, Titus was willing, Titus Justus was willing to invite 
pulled into his house. He was willing to invite Paul into, uh, to, into his house and share life with him. And we must be willing to do the same. We must be willing to welcome people in our homes. And if you're a leader, you already know this. That you're, you're, the, the door to your house needs to be open all the time. Because people always will come. You want it or not, you expect it or not, you will hear a knock on the door. And we need to be hospitable. And so justice was that. And part of hospitality, by the way, involves opening our lives to and ourselves to other people. And especially when it comes to being a team. Being a team means we open our lives to the team members. We open our homes to the team members. We let them in. But of course, that must be a mutual feeling. That must be something that is shared by everyone, that we open ourselves to each other. I might be going through a challenge, but if I don't talk about it, the team members cannot know, and therefore they cannot help me. They cannot do what they could do to help me because they don't know what I'm going through. And they'll only know when I share it with them. That's why it's very important that we share lives. Be hospitable. Right? Well, when, when you read First Timothy chapter 3, one of the qualifications of a leader, at least of an elder, there is hospitality must be a hospitable person. Right? Being part of a team requires that as well. Being part of a healthy team. Right? And so if we're going to be a team, we must be willing to let others into our lives. If you're not willing to do that, then you cannot, you'll just struggle in being part of a team or you make the team struggle with you as a part of it. The next one we see, the last one, share your faith. <coughs> share your faith. So how can we be part of a healthy team or a team that is serving the purpose of what God called it to be? Well, by sharing your faith. And so, well, verses 8, 9, 10, 11. And so Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians believed. Why? Hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to him in the night, do not be afraid. Continue speaking. He said, many believed. The Greeks and the, the Gentiles, so to speak, including Crispus who was a leader of the synagogue and he's the member of his household heard the gospel and believe and how did they hear because someone shared the gospel right and so we see that the ruler of the synagogue himself heard the gospel and believed the members of his household heard the gospel and believed many believed and many were baptized as a result of that because Paul was sharing the gospel because they heard the preaching of God's word. Well, Paul asked this question in his letter to believers in Rome, in Romans chapter 10. Of course, in chapter verse 9 says, For if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will be saved. For with the heart one believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But then he continues, he says, But for all who call upon the name of the Lord, shall be safe. When he says, but how are they going to call on him in whom they have not heard? How are people going to call on Jesus Christ for their salvation if they have not heard about Jesus? And how are they going to hear if someone is not preaching to them? You see, if we're going to be a flourishing team, a team that is serving the purpose of why God has called it to be, a team that is about the kingdom business, the Great Commission, we must be willing to share the gospel, share our faith, and make it about Jesus, not our achievement, not our lives, not what we're doing or what we're not doing, what we've achieved, what we're going through. We must make it about Jesus and point people to him. Whether challenges are there or not, we must preach Christ and Christ crucified because all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, but for them to call upon Jesus' name, they must hear the name of Jesus being proclaimed, and for them to hear, someone must preach it, and you and I are the ones who have been called to preach Christ and Christ crucified. 
So how can we be a team and how can we continue being a team and a team that is living for God's glory? Well, share your faith. We see Paul and his, and his friends were not sharing the gospel and talking about Jesus because everything was comfortable. No, they didn't say, well, we have a position and threats are there. So we are going to wait until things settles and normalizes. Then we will talk. No, in the midst of oppositions and threats and uncertainties, they were preaching Christ and Christ crucified. You know why? Because people are dying. If whether things are okay or not, they're dying and they need Jesus. You know why? Because the souls of humanity is more important than our temporary comfort. Because when they die without Jesus, they will forever, for eternity, be separated from Christ. And Paul said later on, you see, for I cannot compare the sufferings that we are going through right now, this temporary suffering with the glory that is going to be revealed in Jesus Christ. That's why it was about the kingdom business. You see, I want to say this, faithfully share your faith with people. Because you don't know who might be hearing the gospel. You don't know who God might bring into his household. You see, as Paul faithfully shared the gospel, look at what happened. The ruler of the synagogue heard the gospel, believed, and God saved, and members of his household heard the gospel, believed, and God saved. The Paul could have said, well, there's no way this ruler of the synagogue is going to believe, so I'm not even going to bother. It's like you're meeting an imam and he says, well, there's no way this imam is going to accept Jesus Christ, so I'm not even going to bother. No, you don't know what God can do and will do with the word faithfully proclaimed. You faithfully proclaim God's word and just sit and watch what God will do. God encouraged Paul to continue preaching. You know, you might have lost hope. Things might not be happening well for you. You probably considered quitting ministry. You're probably thinking about it, or maybe you've already done it, but I want you to hear God's message and this message that God gave to Paul. Allow it speak to you today. Allow it encourage you today to continue preaching because look at what God told Paul here. God told him, one, do not be afraid. Two, go on speaking. And three, don't be silent. Four, for I am with you. He says, do not be afraid. Don't look at your circumstances. Don't look at your surrounding. Don't be afraid. Go on speaking. Don't be silent. I am with you. You see, God said, I have many in this city who are mine. I have many who are in this city and they are mine. You see, sometimes we get blinded with circumstances that we begin thinking we might be the only one. And God needs to remind us like he reminded Paul that there are many in this city who are mine. So continue preaching. Elijah felt the same when Ahab and Jezebel were chasing and pursuing for his life. He said, God, they've killed everyone, and I'm just the only one. They're about to kill me. And God says, no, 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 you're not the only one. I still have 7,000 faithful men, faithful servants who have not bowed their knees to Baal, and you can continue. Elijah, Elisha with his servant, Elisha was moving and his servant, they were surrounded by the enemy and his servant said, we're finished. We don't have anyone. And he said, no, 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 we do. He said, no, I don't see anyone. And Elijah said, God, please open his eyes to see. And I pray today that God will open your eyes to see. The thousands of the faithful men and women that, that still belongs to God. That God opened your eyes to see why it is very important that you continue preaching Christ and Christ crucify. That maybe you're about to quit. You have considered it. Maybe you've given up. That, that you hear God's word today. You hear him telling you, do not be afraid because I am with you. 
Do not be afraid. Continue preaching Christ. Continue proclaiming. Don't be silent. I am with you because I have many in this city who are mine. They belong to me. Guys, let's be a team. Let's continue preaching Christ and Christ crucified. And of course, you read and follow as a result, Paul stayed in this place for 18 months, a year and a half, preaching Christ and Christ crucified, sharing the gospel, encouraging believers here and encouraging believers in other places. And the Jews made another talk. You see, Satan will always oppose the things of God. That is why we must always continue and never say, well, things are not okay right now. We will wait for it to be okay. It will never be okay as long as you are preaching Christ and him crucified. As long as you've made up your mind to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. And so things will not be okay if you want to wait for things to be okay. The only way you will have a, a problem-free life, free from persecution, is when you deny Jesus Christ. And that, please, don't ever think even about it. Is when you begin compromising your faith and don't think about it. Just want to finish with this. There's a statement. There's something that Galileo made. And so the Jews begin attacking. Paul again, and they they bring him before Galileo, the proconsul, and brought him, and this is the accusation. This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. There's something that Galileo said. Look at what he said in verse 14. At the end of verse 14, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime or Jews, I would have been it's in reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, situates, I refuse to be a judge on this thing. You see, there's something that Galileo says here that is very important. And the world and its leadership have failed to acknowledge it. This is what Galileo was saying. Now, Galileo is not a believer, by the way, at least as far as we know. But this is what he's saying. He says, it should not and cannot be a crime to preach the gospel. Because if it were a matter of wrongdoing and vicious crime, I would have reason to respond. But this guy is preaching Christ. He's talking about a name. He's calling people to follow this person. It's not a crime to preach, and it should not be. He's saying it should not be made a crime to preach Christ and Christ crucified. Well, unfortunately, the world kind of thinks it is a crime to preach Christ and Christ crucified because their mind is twisted and, and, and their mind has been darkened because they're still following Satan who is the prince of the power of this air who is at work in the sense of disobedience. Preach the gospel so that people are set free from the bondage of sin that the enemy has trapped them in. But guys, we can only do that as a team and let us be a team God's team, and God has built a team, he's building a team, and he's called you and I to be part of that team. Let us be faithful. And remember this, God is with you, and he will never leave you. See what he's saying? He said, the author of Hebrews says, if God is, you see, we can, we can con conclude this, because he said, I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. And say, then we can conclude this. We are okay. It'll be okay, guys. Things might not be okay right now. It might not be going well the way you hoped and planned. But the Lord is with you. And it will be okay. Do not be afraid. Do not stop proclaiming. You continue. Because the Lord is with you. Because there are many in the city, in this town, where you are. Who belongs to him. And one, they need to hear the gospel. But two, those who already belong to him are also preaching the gospel. You're not alone, as you might think. The Lord is with you. May God's blessing be upon you. And want us to say a word of prayer, a brief one. Precious Father, we thank you for being with us. Thank you for your son. His very name, Emmanuel, means God with us. 
And you've just reminded us from your word that you are with us. You've encouraged us to continue being faithful and being a team and preaching Christ and Christ crucified. Thank you for calling us to be part of your team. Even though we don't deserve to be in your team, you've still lovingly and graciously called us to be a part of your team. May we be found faithful, Lord. And I want to pray for everyone today. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what the week and the month has been like for them. I don't know what's happening in the ministries you've called them to be in, but you do. I don't know the discouragement they might have faced and felt, but Lord, you do. And I pray that you minister to them, that you strengthen them, that they hear your voice louder and more clearer today than ever before. You telling them you are with them and they can trust you. I want to pray for those who are not feeling well, that you minister to them, that you strengthen their bodies and bring healing to them. And we thank you for George and what you've been doing in his life and in his health. And we're thankful that he's able to walk, that he's able that there's progress and change in his life. And Lord, we pray that you just continue doing what you're doing to re relieve him and deliver him and restore him back on his feet so he can get back into the kingdom business you've called him to be. We pray for Geraldine and the family as they continue taking care of him, as they continue serving him and being there for him, that you strengthen their faith, that you build them and grow them in the process and we thank you for the church families out there we've prayed for we've supported and are still doing that for the church's family that you continue strengthening them that your blessings be upon them guide us and meet our needs we pray for our nation uganda and our leaders that you give them wisdom that you call them to seeking you and serving you and doing what glorifies your name but above it all, we pray as a church that you not only meet our needs, but that we will be a light shining in this dark and twisted world for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, God bless you, and we're thankful for you. Thank you for joining us in fellowship today. Just want to encourage us. We're, we're working on having some, some worship songs, and hopefully it's going to be posted uh, if it's not already posted on Acacia Community Church Facebook page, please take time and just uh, join some of our, our worship team members and just uh, worship the Lord in the process. And of course, I also want to remind you, uh, just announced on a med last Sunday, Roy Kasika and Martina uh, Purple are having their marriage or wedding coming up soon on 14th of uh, August. Please support them, pray with them and uh, reach out to me in case there's anything you want to know about them or how you can support them and be a part of uh, the union that, that is coming for them as they start this life in a way that glorifies the Lord. We love you and we're thankful for you. And I just want to say this, if whenever you can, if you are able to give, please do so that the work of the Lord continues at Acacia Community Church. In case you want to know how you can do that, please send me a message and I'll reach out to you and let you know how you can just give for God's ministry to continue. We love you and God's blessing upon you. Please remember, God is with you. All right, we love you. Blessings.